Nicholas turned from the bed, moving as though wakened from sleep. Her foul gluttony has killed her, he said. There was no emotion in his voice except a faint sadness. It was a statement of fact. Nor was it until the next day that it struck Jeff as a strangely unfeeling remark, for it was what he had been thinking himself. Nicholas walked to the door and saw the frightened girl. Go to bed, Miranda, he said. It's all over. She gave a smothered gasp. From the moment of approaching that room, the events had had the unreality of nightmare. She was stupefied. She obeyed Nicholas and walked back to her room like a somnambulist. The patron, going out into the hall, called the awed servants together and gave instructions. Jeff, raising his head, saw that he was alone in the room with the sheeted figure. Scarcely knowing why he did it, he broke off a piece of the tipsy cake and, wrapping it in the napkin, stuffed it in his pocket. Then he picked up his bag and prepared to leave that dismal room. On his way, he passed the little oleander bush. He remembered Johanna's apparent pride in it. Poor woman, he thought. There had been mighty little pity or tenderness about her passing. Soon, as he left the manor behind him, he heard, as did everyone else in Dragonwick, the tolling of the village church bell. Dong, 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 clanged the great iron clapper. Thirty-four times, one for each year of Johanna's completed life. Chapter 9 By the evening of the second day after Johanna's death, Dragonwick teemed with strangers. Coach after coach, the curtains drawn down, rolled up to the black wreathed door to discharge the Van Tappen relatives from Greenbush, from Albany, and Water Vallette. The halls and stairs resounded with the shuffling of countless feet as friends, tradesmen, tenants, anybody who felt the wish to do so, mounted to the bedroom and paid their last respects to the lady of the manor. She lay there in state, upon the ancestral bed between two burning tapers, a black velvet pall covering all but her face. There were flowers enough now in Johanna's room, masses of white tuberoses and lilies to replace the oleander, Messengers from Hudson had brought bolts of black materials for which all the drapers had been ransacked. Magda and the maid sewed furiously. By four o'clock, Miranda had completed her own dress. The untrimmed black gave her a vivid distinction, but for once she had no interest in her appearance. She was numb with horror and unbelief. It can't be true, she repeated to herself. Death can't happen like that, so quickly. She didn't seem very sick. The girl had not left her room since Nicholas ordered her into it. Her food had been brought up to her on trays, and Magda, who had assumed control of the household since the patron had locked himself into his room as a bereaved husband should, made it clear that Miranda would not be welcome downstairs amongst the Van Tappens but the great bedroom at the end of the hall drew Miranda with a morbid fascination. At dusk, she crept out and joined a group of strangers who were murmuring in shocked undertones before Johanna's door. She walked with them into the silent room and took her turn at filing past the bed. I wish I hadn't hated her so, thought the girl. And suddenly tears ran down her face for she hadn't known until that moment how much she had hated Johanna. It was Magda who brought Miranda's supper tray and flung it on the table. "'You'll be leaving, of course, after the funeral,' said the woman rudely. Miranda swallowed. "'I suppose so,' she said. "'Yes, of course she must go. She couldn't stay here alone with Nicholas.' "'Nicholas.' 
The girl clasped her hands tight and walked over to the window, hiding her face from the maid's spiteful glare. When the woman had gone, Miranda pushed the tray away untouched. Nicholas was immeasurably farther away from her after this tragedy than he had ever been. For him, too, his wife in death must have assumed a strange new importance. How much sorrow and loss he felt, she wasn't sure. She had never been sure what Nicholas felt for Johanna, and yet she was his wife, the mother of his child. He must feel it terribly. And Miranda buried her face on her arms. After a while, she undressed and went to bed, exhausted by the previous night's sleeplessness. At midnight, the house was quiet. No more footsteps shuffled down the hall. The Van Tappens had long since retired. Miranda slept heavily, so that she did not waken when the door opened and shut again. But she heard her name and opened her dazed eyes to see Nicholas looking down at her. She lay mute, her beautiful eyes staring and still clouded with sleep. He put his candle on the table, came back by the bed. She saw the black mourning band on his arm and could not look past it, nor raise her gaze to his face. Miranda, he said, look at me. Slowly she obeyed him dragging her eyes upward from the black band. He drew a harsh breath. With one violent motion, he jerked her up against him. He kissed her savagely, and against her shrinking breast, she felt the pounding of his heart. No, no, she whispered, terrified, struggling to push him back. He raised his head, withdrawing his arms so that she fell back against the pillows. He stood up, gave a short laugh. If I wished yes, do you think your silly no, no would stop me? I, I don't know, she whispered. His tigerish ferocity had frightened her, but now that he stood apart from her, again cool and controlled, her eyes filled and she looked at him with pleading. Get up and put on your dressing gown, he said. While she did so, he turned his back, went over to the fire and poked up its dying embers. When she was ready, she went to him, stood tall and slender in her white robe, her hair pushed childishly back behind her ears and cascading down about her shoulders. He reached forward and took her left hand. She watched, uncomprehending, while he pushed a massive ring on her third finger. She stared at the ring. It was old gold made into the likeness of two tiny hands with diamond tips, which clasped a dark red carbuncle, roughly heart-shaped. It's the Van Rin betrothal ring, he said. She lifted her bewildered gaze from the ring to his face. Ah, I don't understand. Ah, yes. You do, Miranda, he said softly. An incredulous joy leaped in her and died. She drew back, for not fifty feet away lay that still sheeted figure smiling the strange little smile. Johanna, she whispered. Nicholas's eyes hardened. In the moment of silence, she heard the unhurried ticking of the clock on the mantel. A dog barked somewhere out by the stables. She never wore the ring, he said. Her finger was too thick. Thank God, she thought in confusion. It must be all right then. Of course it's all right if she never wore it. You will do exactly as I say, said Nicholas. The dark red stone on her finger glowed in the firelight, the tiny diamond sparkled. Yes, oh, yes, she whispered, always. Hide the ring. Mention it to no one. Friday you will go home. In exactly twelve months I shall claim you. Twelve months, she repeated. Naturally there will be a year of mourning. 
But Nicholas, she cried, clasping her hands and looking at him in despair, I can't believe. I never hoped or thought. Do you really love me? You haven't said so. Nicholas smiled. He put his hands on her shoulders. I've asked you to share my name. Tender speeches are for schoolboys. Live for the future, Miranda, as I shall. He bent and kissed her swiftly. Then he was gone, and the girl, alone by the fire, sat staring as though hypnotized at the betrothal ring. At the same moment in Hudson, Jeff, in his locked surgery, the curtains carefully drawn, finished the last of the experiments he had been making. He had no book on toxicology, but had found some pertinent data in one of his pharmacological textbooks. On a plate before him lay a few crumbs, all that remained of the specimen of cake he had abstracted from Dragonwick. The rest he had examined through his microscope, which was weak, but powerful enough to have shown up any tiny grains of white or gray powder. There were none. Following the directions in his book, he had burned a portion of the cake in a retort, and on still another piece had poured certain chemicals. All results were negative. Now, with a sudden revulsion of feeling, he picked up the plate and shied it into his stone sink, where it smashed to splinters. I ought to be ashamed of myself, he thought. My suspicions are nothing but childish pique that my medical knowledge was at fault and I lost a patient. He shut the textbook and put it back on the shelf to accumulate dust. He tidied up the surgery and went to bed, resolving never to think of the matter again. Chapter 10 Johanna was buried with all the pomp befitting her station. Miranda took no part in the proceedings. No one invited her to do so. She stayed alone in her room, and the next morning she started on her journey home. The river still being closed to boats, Nicholas sent her in the light coach with Dick, the second coachman, to drive, and Greta, a middle-aged chambermaid, to chaperone her. They would have to spend two nights on the road, the first at the Beekman Arms in Rhinebeck, the second at Peeksill, and a young lady could not stay alone in an inn. There was a dismal feeling of indifference, almost of disgrace, about Miranda's hurried departure at seven in the morning. She went to Katrina's room to say goodbye, but the child was sleepy and unresponsive. All her interest was centered on the projected visit to Aunt Van Tappen in Albany. Far worse than Katrina's indifference was Nicholas's absence. The girl had been sure that he would appear to wish her Godspeed, even if they had no chance for a private word, but he did not. Greta, plump and stolid in black alpaca, already waited in the coach. Miranda's parcels and new trunk filled with the clothes she had acquired at Dragonwick, were neatly lashed on top. Dick's red face was impatient, and the horses snorted and stamped, anxious to be off into the chilly spring morning. There was nothing to do but get in. The heavy door slammed, and the coachman cracked his whip. Miranda pressed her face to the window pane and looked her last at Dragonwick. Its tower and gables shone brightly as brass in the rays of the rising sun, desolation seized her, and the image of the great house dissolved in a mist of tears. Her hand crept to the ring in an effort at reassurance which was becoming habitual, and she sank back on the seat, trying to hide her face from Greta. The woman opened a string bag and drew out a letter which she tendered to Miranda. "'Here, miss,' she said, "'Meneer said to give you after we leave.' A stupid face showed no curiosity. She was a good, obedient servant, incapable of initiative or speculation. It was for this reason that Nicholas had picked her to accompany Miranda. The girl's heart beat fast as she opened the letter. It said, I very much regret not bidding you farewell. It's better not. And there is that between us 
that needs no words to express. Already one day of the appointed time has passed, my dear one. N. Forgetting discretion, Miranda pressed the note to her lips, then looked nervously at the silent Greta, wondering if she had been observed. But the woman had gone to sleep. Miranda tucked the letter in her bodice next to the ring. Her desolation was forgotten. I'll be so good, she thought. I'll study and improve my mind so as to be worthy of him. Then there was so much to be done, dozens of dainty underclothes to be made and linen to be monogrammed. She would not come to him empty-handed. She suppressed the disquieting thought that all this preparation would be hard in view of Nicholas's command to tell no one. She would manage somehow. With each mile that separated her from Dragonwick, the horror and gloom of the last few days dimmed. Her relationship to Nicholas changed and became as she wanted it to be. He loved her, and she loved him, and soon they would be married, the natural termination of any romance. She shut her memory against Johanna, as against Nicholas's black and inexplicable moods. One must never look back, she thought blithely, feeling mature and philosophical. It's only the future that matters, just as Nicholas said. Afternoon on the third day, they passed through Bedford Village and continued down the North Way. In a few more miles, Miranda recognized landmarks near home. She welcomed these with eagerness, and her long-submerged yearning for her mother at last claimed her. When they reached Stanwich, she leaned forward, hanging out of the window, excitedly directing the coachman and straining her eyes for the first glimpse of the farm. Still, when at last she saw the square, white-frame house beneath the elm trees, she was dismayed. It was so small so insignificant. And in the yard before the kitchen door stood the farm wagon steaming with a load of manure which Tom and her father were pitching from a pile by the stable. Both men looked up as they heard the carriage approach. She saw that they were unshaven, sweating, and dirty. The coachman had nearly passed the farm road by before she found her voice. "'Turn here,' she called to the box in a small, defiant voice, this is where I live. She suffered under the man's stare of astonishment. He pulled up the horses and guided them through the narrow gate. Greta, stolid as ever, glanced at the farm with incurious eyes. The coach stopped just short of the manure pile, and Dick, opening the door for Miranda, waited respectfully, hat in hand. Tom and Ephraim stood transfixed. Then the boy's jaw dropped. Gosh almighty, Pa, it's Ranny, he cried. Ephraim recovered from his surprise and his bearded face set in disapproval. So I see. He advanced to the girl, who stood nervously on the carriage step, unwilling to risk her delicate kid slippers in the barnyard muck. Well, miss, said her father, did your fine folks get tired of you and pack you back again? Oh, no, Pa, she cried, flushing. Though she was not particularly glad to see her father, she had expected a warmer welcome. Mrs. Van Ryn died last Monday, and of course I came home. There was no time to write. Indeed, said Ephraim, wiping his hands on a spotted red handkerchief. I'm sorry to hear of the poor lady's passing. But we're all mortal, and the Lord strikes where he will. Home is the place for you, and always has been. Stop swaying on that step like a chicken with a pip. You'll find your ma around to the back in the herb garden. She'll likely be glad to see you. Thus commanded, Miranda gathered up her silk skirts and descended gingerly. Ephraim turned to his son. Tom, I reckon we can find room to stable these horses, but the coach will have to stay outside. As for you, he paused, having just discovered Greta inside and clearly not knowing what to do with her and the coachman. Miranda will cook you up some supper. We'll find your bed somewhere. Oh, no, Pa, Miranda cried again in embarrassment. She saw the twinkle in the coachman's eyes at the thought of her cooking him up some supper. 
she who at Dragonwick had always been served by a dozen hands. Mr. Van Ryn has made arrangements for them to return at once. They'll spend tonight on the road. Goodbye, she added quickly to the servants. Thank you very much. My brother will help you get my trunk off. And she fled around the corner of the house. She saw a thin figure in an old grey sunbonnet stooping over the herb patch, and forgetting her shoes and skirts, she flew with a cry of joy. Ma, dear, oh, Ma, I'm so glad to see you. Abigail straightened and was startled out of her Yankee reserve by the sight of the slender, fashionable figure. She opened her arms and caught her daughter to her breast. There began for Miranda a period of difficult adjustment. Nearly a year had passed since she left them. Home had not changed, but she had immeasurably. And except for Abigail, her family that first evening appeared to her as rather uncouth strangers. The baby did not know her and screamed with terror at the scented and ringleted lady in rustling green silk. All three of her brothers eyed her in wary embarrassment after a stiff greeting. Tabitha, flushed from tending the oven, her apron awry, cried, my land, Ranny, I'd never have known you. And the sisters exchanged a brief kiss. But there was no warmth in Tibby's greeting either. Her scrutiny of Miranda mingled envious resentment with disapproval. Silk dress, low-cut bosom, lace, kid slippers, and she's got powder on her face, thought Tabitha, horrified. She tightened her lips, and while they all sat down to supper around the kitchen table, she glanced at her father, sure that he was sharing her disapproval and would soon voice it. Nor did Ephraim disappoint her. When he had finished grace, he rested his carving knife and fork on the home-cured ham hock before him and surveyed Miranda. You aiming to do the dishes in that ridiculous rig? he inquired. Tabitha giggled, and the smaller boys nudged each other. Before Miranda could answer... Her mother leaned forward and said quickly, It's just for tonight, Ephraim. Ranny was tired from the traveling. She'll get into the hang of things tomorrow again. Ephraim grunted. She'd better. I'll have no idle, furbelowed, fiddly-dee girls around here. He picked up the carving knife and said no more. The family, who were braced for a protracted lecture, settled in some surprise to their food. Miranda's appearance discomfited her father. He could not help but see that the girl had grown extraordinarily pretty, and that in both her dress and her manner she now resembled the fine ladies he had seen at Astor House. He was grudgingly impressed by her arrival this afternoon, the blazoned coach, the two servants, the sleek horses in their silver harness. Mr. Van Ryn must have thought a lot of the girl to provide her with such state, but now she was home again. Any highfalutin nonsense she had learned must be knocked out of her. He helped himself to fried potatoes and shoved the dish toward Abigail. Miranda toyed with her food. Being at home again was like settling slowly down into the narrow end of a funnel. Everything oppressed her. The farm talk, the family prayers and Bible reading— in her absence, Ephraim had finished the New Testament and was back to Deuteronomy. The eight o'clock bedtime, the sharing of her bed with Tabitha. It won't be for long, snapped Tabitha, seeing the look of dismay which Miranda cast at the bed that seemed to her incredibly narrow. Soon you'll have it all to yourself. Miranda examined her sister's plump, triumphant face. Why? What do you mean, Tibby? Ob and I are being married next month, said the younger girl, thinking, and that's more than you'll be for all your fancy clothes and that you're two years older. Miranda sat down on the bed, remembering Obadiah's broad face, his little stutter, his thick hands. Are you in love with him, Tibby? she asked gravely. The other girl nodded, embarrassed. One didn't speak of love right out like that, but Ranny had always been queer. Then I hope you'll be very happy, 
said Miranda, her voice not quite steady. Nicholas, she thought with a paroxysm of longing. The year now stretched forward an eon. Will it ever be next month for me too? She longed to tell Tabitha, just for the pleasure of speaking his name, but she knew that she must not. The ring was safely concealed beneath the high neck nightgown. I have two silk dresses, she went on quickly. Choose either one you want, Tibby, and I'll make it over to fit you. Oh, Ranny, thank you, cried her sister, overcome. That's real sweet of you. You always were much cleverer with a needle than me, she added, determined to be generous, too. She dropped most of her touchiness as she discovered that Miranda did not mean to patronize her, and that far from having to listen to long accounts of the glories and refinements of Dragonwick, Miranda did not want to talk about her visit at all. Instead, she listened patiently to Tibby's description of Ob's virtues and the three-room cottage which was being built on a corner of the brown farm for the young couple. Parlor, kitchen, and bedroom, and the parlor papered, whispered Tabitha exultantly to the quiet figure beside her in bed. Of course, later, the house won't be big enough, she added, blushing into the dark. Ob said, said, he hoped we'd have to add more space every year. Wasn't that awful of him? Shocking, agreed Miranda. She tried to picture Nicholas and herself in a three-room cottage. It was impossible. The image of Nicholas was inextricably mingled with magnificence, with brocades and gilt and invisible service, the somber and regal atmosphere of Dragonwick. She put her hand down the collar of her nightgown and felt for the ring. The heart-shaped carbuncle was warm from her body. She slipped her finger through the gold circle. Long after Tabitha had gone to sleep, she lay staring up at the low raftered ceiling, making no sound, but slow tears trickled down her face onto the uncomfortable corn husk mattress. Chapter 11 Tabitha was married on Saturday, the 31st of May, in the Second Congregational Meeting House on the Hill. The church was crammed with representative Greenwich families, Meads, Reynoldses, Pecks, Closes, and Husteds. Tibby looks lovely, thought Miranda with pride as she followed her sister and father up the aisle. Tabitha wore Miranda's watered gray silk trimmed with ruching. The difference in their heights had made it possible to cut enough from the bottom to piece out the bodice and waist, which were much too small. Miranda had also donated tiny green ostrich feathers to trim the poke bonnet. A white wedding dress would have been unthinkable extravagance for a farmer's wife, and without Miranda's generosity, Tabitha would have been married in a serviceable cashmere or alpaca. Obadiah waited beside the pulpit for his bride his broad face scrubbed and shining. Ephraim handed over his younger daughter and stepped aside with Miranda. The Reverend Clark opened the Bible and raised his hands. The congregation bowed their heads, all but Abigail. She clenched her worn fingers on the front of the pew and gazed at the group beneath the pulpit. Obadiah's mother glanced sideways at the tense figure beside her and whispered sympathetically, it's hard to have them leave us, Abby, but all will be a good son to you, and they're not going far. Abigail nodded. It was not at Tabitha that she had been looking, but at Miranda, for she had surprised on the girl's downcast face an expression of suffering and a pain so obvious that the mother's heart was shocked. I knew it, thought Abigail, deeply troubled. Something has happened to the girl that she's not told me. While searching for the cause of Miranda's unhappiness, an unhappiness which Abigail had felt and tried to deny to herself during this past month, the marriage service was finished, and she realized with compunction that during Tabitha's supreme moment she had had no thoughts for her younger daughter at all. Some thirty guests drove down the turnpike to Stanwich Road and then to the Wells Farm for the spread. 
apple, dried peach and rhubarb pies, ham, doughnuts, coffee and cider. Abigail and her daughters had been cooking for days. The older people sat apart beneath the trees and watched the young ones play kissing games. Even Ephraim saw no harm in that at a wedding, nor did any of the other farmers, who might enforce their blue laws, but enjoyed a strenuous and unrefined frolic just the same. Miranda longed to go off by herself to the quiet of the little attic room, which she would no longer have to share, but she dared not, knowing that her absence would annoy her father. She tried to keep out of the way, busying herself with carrying pies and plates back and forth from the kitchen, and the young people let her be. Some of the men made sheep's eyes at her, but they were afraid of her. She was tall and lovely and remote in her green silk dress. "'Stuck up she is,' whispered little Phoebe Mee to Deborah Wilson in the corner of the barn, where they had both run for refuge from Zack Wilson, who was it at the moment, and lurched blindfolded now this way, now that, trying to catch one of the girls in his outstretched arms. Miranda shrank behind a tree as she saw her former admirer stumble in her direction, and would have escaped him except that Ob, her new brother-in-law, seized her around the waist and shoved her toward Zack's groping hands. Everyone stopped running to watch. There were titters. She stood stiff as a fence pole while the rough fingers pawed her dress, her hair. "'Tis Ranny!' shouted Zack, and tearing off the blindfold, he gave her a wet, smacking kiss on the mouth. Quick as thought, she slapped him hard across his fat cheek, and he stumbled backward. "'Catch yourself an iceberg next time, Zack,' shouted a male voice. "'Leastways they don't slap!' Miranda turned slowly. She saw Tabitha's indignant look. Ranny making a scene, spoiling everyone's fun, and at the wedding, too. Color rushed to Miranda's cheeks. "'I'm sorry, Tibby,' she whispered. Then, catching up her skirt, she ran into the house. Abigail had seen the whole incident, though Ephraim fortunately had not. "'I'll just go look at the oven. It cools down mighty quick,' she murmured, and followed her daughter. She found Miranda upstairs, face down across the bed, and crying so hard that she did not hear her mother's light footstep. But she felt the touch on her hair and jumped up. "'Ranny, lass?' said Abigail gently. Tell me what ails you. I can see. She stopped, staring. Against Miranda's bodice there hung a carved gold ring with a heart-shaped red stone. The girl covered it quickly with her hand, but her mother shook her head and pulled the ring from under the clutching fingers. What is this, Miranda? she said sternly. And why are you hiding it? I'm waiting, dearie. She put her arm around the girl's shoulders, and Miranda, with a choked sound, hid her face on her mother's thin chest. "'It's the Van Rin betrothal ring,' she whispered. Abigail, completely bewildered, felt sharp dismay. Could it be that Ranny had taken the ring in some clandestine way, and afraid to admit her fault, therefore hid it? It was obviously of great value. Her protecting arm fell away. How did you come by it? she snapped. Miranda lifted her head. Now that it had been forced on her, it could be no breach of faith to tell. He gave it to me, she said proudly. Nicholas. For an instant her mother was conscious only of relief. It was not surprising that Mr. Van Ryn should have made the girl a present at parting, since he had been most generous throughout. Then her bewilderment returned. But why a betrothal ring? And why do you hide it? And, she added with growing apprehension, you call him Nicholas. Surely that's not respectful, Ranny. Miranda got up. She moved slowly from the bed to the little deal table on which she had arranged her toilet articles. The bottle of lustral water was misplaced. She shifted it, picked up her horn comb, and laid it down again. I'm going to marry him, Ma, she said. What? cried Abigail. Miranda turned. Her chin was lifted a little. Her long eyes were both frightened and defiant. But on her mouth there was a small smile. I am, Ma, next spring. But, Ranny, it's not possible. You must be mad, girl. 
Abigail laced her hands, all her usual decisiveness dissolved in confusion. He's too old for you. From the many crowding objections, this was the first that came to her, her picture of Nicholas as a settled middle-aged gentleman. Miranda gave a soft little laugh, remembering that her mother must still think of Nicholas as they had imagined him last summer. Oh, Ma, he's only thirty-two, and the handsomest man in the world. I see that he's not as I thought him, Miranda, she said gravely, but that makes no difference. How can it be that his wife died on Monday, and you left on the Friday, and yet he gave you a betrothal ring? Her voice fell like a cold stone through the little room. The girl made an involuntary gesture of defense. Yes, she said, groping for words. I know it seemed... I, I know it's hard to understand. It wasn't exactly that way. She swallowed. Suddenly she flung herself down beside her mother, clasping the spare knees and looking up at Abigail with a desperate pleading. I love him so, Ma. I loved him from the beginning, I think. Oh, won't you try to understand, please? And he... He never was happy with Johanna. Abigail slowly relaxed, allowing her love for this child to stifle the doubts which afflicted her. The ways of the gentry are different, she thought, and who am I to judge them? She was silent, stroking the girl's hair, and there came to her gradually a half-guilty pride. It would be a very grand marriage. Your pa, she began, still trying to adjust herself to the staggering idea. Pa mustn't know for a long time, said Miranda quickly. No one must know. He said that. Nicholas. Frowning, Abigail turned from her daughter's appealing gaze. She saw the reason for secrecy. All of Greenwich would be scandalized if they knew Miranda's plans. And yet this hole and corner business, something wrong about it, Something snide, thought Abigail. But the last loves him. She'll be a great lady. I'll not spoil her chances. She rose briskly, smoothed down her poplin dress. Wash your face and see if the fresh pies are ready. I'll keep her secret, Ranny. She gave her mother a look of fervent gratitude. There was comfort in having shared her secret. The sharing had made it real for there were times when it seemed that she must have dreamed Dragonwick and all that had happened to her there. Suppose Nicholas forgot her. Suppose he hadn't really meant it. Suppose he met someone else. The summer days dragged by, and Miranda's fears grew. By the end of September, Miranda could stand the silence no longer. She could not eat. She slept badly. Her talismans, the ring and the note from Nicholas, which she had received on the morning of her departure from Dragonwick, no longer served to reassure her. It was true that she had intuitively accepted the fact that he might not write her. And she knew as surely that there had been a tacit interdiction against her writing to him. Yet why not, thought Miranda feverishly, what could be more natural? A few words thanking him for his kindness to her, asking about his health? a letter that anyone might read without suspicion. One morning, when the men were working in the fields, and Abigail had gone down the road to see Tabitha, Miranda stole into the front room and sat down at her father's cherry desk. She made four drafts, and finally copied the last one onto a sheet of lined paper from the back of Ephraim's ledger. There was no other paper. Stanwich Road, Greenwich, September 25th, 1845. Dear Cousin Nicholas, It seems eternity. She scraped this out with a penknife and substituted a long time. Since I left Dragonwick. I trust you are in good health, and Katrina as well. My thoughts ever turn to you. She stopped, hastily added an R. Your kindness and hospitality. Please, she erased that. I would esteem it a great favor to hear if you are quite well. She laid the pen down and gazed with miserable eyes out of the window into the rustling elm leaves. How to sign it? Not sincerely, not affectionately. There was no word that she dared to write. She picked up the pen and put down Miranda. 
carefully embellished with the flourishes she had learned at the academy. She folded the sheet, sealed, and addressed it. That afternoon she walked three miles to the horse-neck post office, had the letter franked, and walked back again through fields of goldenrod and up the shady Stanwich Road, and her heart was lighter. Surely he would understand, would read between the lines and send her word of reassurance. But weeks passed, and there was no answer. The girl's going in a decline, thought Abigail, watching her daughter anxiously. I wish she'd never gone to Dragonwick or heard of that Nicholas. She was always over-romantic, and to my everlasting shame I guess I encouraged her. Eat your vittles, Ranny, she would urge with irritation born out of worry. You look like a picked crow. I agreed Ephraim on one occasion, wiping his mouth and examining his daughter. What ails you these days, child? You wear a face long enough to eat oats out of a churn. He had been better pleased with her lately. She was quiet and biddable. It had occurred to him that she seemed a bit mopish, but girls were unstable, moody creatures, full of silly whims. Her father frowned and opened his mouth to speak when Nat created a diversion. Looky, he cried, peering through the kitchen window. There's a stranger on her own horse just turned through our gate. Miranda started. Against all reason, wild hope set her heart to pounding. She crowded with the others to the window. They all watched the approaching horsemen. Strangers were an event. Can't be a peddler, said Nat. He has no pack. The roan horse walked slowly, its head drooping. The rider was concealed by his woolen cape and battered beaver hat. Someone who's lost his way, suggested Abigail. A thought struck her, the same that had come to Miranda. She glanced at the girl and saw from the hopeless disappointment in her face that at any rate this was not Nicholas. "'I'll see what he wants,' said Ephraim, going out of the door. At that moment the stranger raised his head, and Miranda gave a cry of surprise. "'Why, it's Dr. Turner!' She stared at the powerful shoulders, the square, smiling face, hating him because he came from upriver, because he reminded her poignantly of Dragonwick, and yet he was not Nicholas. He might have news, though, she thought with rising excitement. Of course he would have news. She ran down the steps as Jeff alighted. For a moment he hardly recognized her. Her golden hair was braided and pinned tight around her head. She wore pink chalet and an apron. She was too thin and pale, so that her long hazel eyes now looked enormous in her sharpened face. Her lips trembled as she smiled at him. Oh, Dr. Turner, she cried impulsively. Have you? Did you? She broke off, conscious that Ephraim was staring at her. Jeff took her hand in his, hardly hearing what she said. He thought that eagerness, that glad crying of his name, were for him, that she was happy to see him. Warmth flowed over him. In her simple clothes, she seemed to him far more beautiful than she had in the fashionable silks and ringlets she had worn at Dragonwick. He was touched by hollows in her cheeks and the shadows beneath her lovely eyes. "'And who may this gentleman be, Ranny?' inquired Ephraim sternly. Jeff dropped her hand and grinned in some confusion. "'I'm Jefferson Turner from Hudson, Mr. Wells. Perhaps Miranda's mentioned me.' "'She has not, sir.' said Ephraim. He, too, misinterpreted his daughter's behavior. This young man must be the reason for the girl's pinings and sighings. But though he liked Jeff on sight, as people usually did, he had no intention of unbending until he had been given a full explanation. Jeff was soon established at the table, while Abigail plied him with roast pork and pie. Miranda saw that her own questions must wait until her father's had been satisfied, and she moved from the stove to the table and back to the stove again in a fever of impatience. It seemed that Jeff had made a trip to New York. For there's a fine doctor there, Dr. John Francis. He has a new treatment for cholera. The old whaler Nellie B. put into Hudson in July, and she brought us some cholera from India. We had only five cases, praise be, but I lost two of them. He put down his knife and his face sobered. I hope they were good Christians and died in the faith of our Lord, said Ephraim. Jeff nodded. 
Oh, their souls are safe enough. It's the welfare of their bodies that concerns me. Young man, said Ephraim, that remark smacks of levity. The body is but dust and ashes. Still, he went on, because he was interested, and despite a possible laxity of principle, the young doctor seemed a fine, upstanding man. Did you find a new medicine for the cholera in the city? Tis nothing in the world but clay, said Jeff ruefully. Chinese clay. Dr. Francis has tried it, and it works well. Jeff explained the uses of clay in cholera, and he told them of his trip from Hudson. He had come by horseback because he wished to stop along the way in Poughkeepsie and Fishkill and White Plains to see friends and confer with other doctors. This morning I was in Rye, he said, smiling, and finding myself so near Greenwich, I thought to come and see Miranda. This was not entirely true. He had meant from the beginning to call on the Wellses, but he did not himself clearly understand why he had wanted to see her again, and the fact embarrassed him. I'm glad you came, said Ephraim heartily. You'll stay with us tonight, of course. You can share Tom's bed. Ranny? He turned to the silent girl. You might walk about a bit with the doctor. Show him the orchard. I'm certain they don't grow apple trees like that where he comes from. Ephraim had made up his mind. No doubt the young fellow had come according. He would have preferred one of the neighbor boys, but Jeff had passed muster. I'll not be harsh with the girl, thought Ephraim. She might have done far worse. So with her father's approval, and followed by a puzzled look from her mother, Miranda and Jeff went for a walk in the apple orchard. "'You're not looking very well, Miranda,' said Jeff gently. "'I think I must give you a tonic.' She walked fast, anxious to get out of hearing of the house. She brushed the remark aside and climbed swiftly over the stone fence. He followed and when they stood on the bumpy ground amongst a few worm-eaten russets, she turned to him with urgency. Tell me, have you been to Dragonwick? Have you seen Mr. Van Ryn? So, he thought, surprised to see how much he minded. That breathless eagerness of greeting was not for me at all. She is still obsessed with the lords of the manor. Dragonwick's closed, he said, has been since June. Mr. Van Ryn is traveling down south somewhere, didn't you know? She shook her head, trying to hide her face from him, but he had seen the tears start to her eyes. I did see him once in September, at poor Barton's new trial, he said unwillingly. He had not meant to tell her this, nor of the message Nicholas had given him for her, for he had persuaded himself that she would have forgotten Nicholas now that she was back home and he profoundly believed that it would be better for her if she had. But in the face of her anguish, he could not deny her. How was he? she asked breathlessly. Oh, please, please tell me. He seemed very well. I only saw him for a minute. He sighed, remembering the crowded little courtroom where Smith Barton had stood his second trial for sedition against the manor lords, the first one having ended in disagreement. Nicholas had been amongst those in the gallery, conspicuous in his black suit. He had watched the proceedings impassively, his handsome head turned a little, his blue eyes showing little interest. As soon as the verdict had been pronounced, he had risen and left the gallery. Jeff, too, had quitted the courtroom, moved by an impulsive and quite impossible wish to go to his friend. The guard soon disabused him. No one might now see the prisoner and he had been walking sadly down the courthouse steps when he felt a touch on his arm. It was Nicholas who said, Good day, Dr. Turner. This must be a bad time for you. At any rate, it's a pleasant one for you, said Jeff, starting to walk on. The verdict is just but harsh, said Nicholas calmly. Were I he, I would kill myself. He'd be far better dead than in prison. I really believe he means that, Jeff had thought, and he had answered. I don't agree with you, Mr. Van Ryn. Life is precious, and what's more, the sentence may be commuted some day. Now, if you'll excuse me, I leave soon for a trip to New York, and I've much to do. Indeed, 
asked Nicholas politely. When I'm thereabouts, I may call on Miss Wells, added Jeff, more from curiosity as to what Nicholas would say than anything else. He had said nothing for a moment, and the peculiar shut expression had appeared in his eyes. If you do see her, he said at last, you might tell her that I shall come down river in April. Certainly, said Jeff, thinking it a very trivial message. He had continued to think so up to this moment, and now he wondered. When he delivered the message to Miranda, he no longer wondered. She was transfigured by a blaze of joy. Did he say that? she cried. Oh, thank you, thank you, Jeff. She was unconscious of her use of his name, half laughing and half crying in her relief. It was all right, then. Nicholas hadn't answered her letter because Dragonwick was shut and he was traveling, but he would be with her in April, as he had promised. She smiled at Jeff, including him now in her joy. Miranda, he said on impulse, why do you make yourself unhappy, always hankering after things you haven't got? Can't you be content here at home? This farm is beautiful. Beautiful? she repeated in amazement, looking around her. The orchard where they stood was on higher ground than the farmhouse, which nestled like a white dove beneath hemlocks and the tall protecting elms. The fields, checkered by stone walls, undulated gently toward the sapphire strip of the distant sound. A late October haze, faintly lavender, filtered the clear air and intensified the perfume of burning leaves. Maples on the Cat Rock Hills blazed red and gold, colors repeated even more strongly by a riot of sumac and goldenrod against the gray wall of the little burying ground. In the adjoining pasture, Buttercup's bell tinkled rhythmically, as Seth guided her toward the barn and the evening milking. "'I suppose the country's pretty enough,' said Miranda vaguely, "'but it has no refinement, no elegance, and as for the farm, it's nothing but work.' She looked down at her hands. Despite her care, they had reddened a little. Two of her almond-shaped fingernails were broken off short. Miranda, you're... he began, and then he laughed. There was no reaching her. Come and show me the rest of the farm. I'm interested in it, even if you're not. And taking her arm, he helped her back over the stone wall. Jeff stayed several days at the Wells' farm, because on the night of his arrival, the baby developed a virulent sore throat. Some hours later, the dread white spots appeared, and the terrified Abigail, who had lost one child from this cause, did not need Jeff to tell her that Charity had diphtheria. She did not need Jeff for diagnosis, but she needed him badly when the suffocating membrane threatened to close the little throat, and only his promptness in making and inserting a hollow reed to the trachea saved the child. Jeff and Abigail worked together for three days and nights, sponging, poulticing, and making inhalations of turpentine. Miranda, who had never had the disease, was banished from the sick room despite her protests. When it was all over, and Charity, with the elasticity of childhood, had started on a quick recovery, the family embarrassed Jeff by its gratitude. I I'll never forget what you've done, never, sobbed Abigail, exhausted by strain and relief. And that night at family worship, Ephraim abandoned the chapters which should have been read in favor of the Good Samaritan. In his prayer he thanked the Lord devoutly, For that thou hast sent us one to succor us in our hour of need. Ephraim accepted Jeff's refusal of any payment for his services, because of the conviction that the young doctor would soon be his son-in-law. He was therefore amazed when Jeff mounted his horse one morning, and after warm farewells to each one of them, departed for Hudson without having asked permission to woo Miranda. "'I can understand the young people nowadays,' Ephraim growled. "'Flighty, don't know their own minds.' A new thought struck him. Very like Jeff's gone home to make arrangements there before he speaks. He'll be back again. <laughs> That's what it is. Perhaps, said Abigail faintly. 
she knew better than to upset her husband before it was necessary. Chapter 12 Nicholas arrived in Greenwich on the 2nd of April, exactly one year from the day on which he had last seen Miranda. He went to Weed's Tavern on Main Street, found the accommodation offered him cramped and noisy, for his rooms fronted on the Boston Post Road, where market wagons, carriages, and stages continually clattered by. So he had his coachman make inquiries, got back in the coach, and traveled through spring mud up the North Street to Stanwich, where he took over the second floor of a little inn. As soon as he was settled, and the flustered innkeeper, who seldom had guests nowadays, had unpacked for him, Nicholas ordered a glass of Madeira. Then he opened his writing case and began a note. An hour later, a stable boy delivered this note at the Wells' farm. It was addressed to Ephraim, who was sluicing his head and face at the pump preparatory to eating supper. He stamped into the kitchen where Miranda and Abigail were laying the table. He held the note out in his wet fingers. I'll be concerned if this don't beat all, he cried. Your fine cousin Nicholas is stopping in Stanwich, and he's coming to see me on a matter of the greatest importance. Miranda took one look at the well-remembered handwriting. The kitchen stove, her mother and father, spun slowly around her. She clutched the edge of the table and shut her eyes. Then quite suddenly, she was calm. The long uncertainty was over. There would be trouble now. Pa would be difficult. But she knew that Nicholas could handle him and could do anything in the world that he wished to. What in Tunket could he want? grumbled Ephraim, running a comb through his beard. Ranny? He turned to his daughter, but Miranda had slipped upstairs. The green silk dress, long unworn, was ready. She took it from the lavender-scented bag where it had hung, waiting. She parted her hair and brushed it around her finger into curls on either side of her face and rolled the rest into a heavy coil on the nape of her neck. She touched the heliotrope cologne to her wrist and forehead, and when she stood fully dressed, she untied the silk cord and, drawing the betrothal ring from its hiding place, she kissed it and put it on her finger. There was the sound of carriage wheels outside when she got downstairs. As she entered the kitchen, they heard a knock on the front door, the one that was never used. Ephraim went to open it, and all the family crowded after him into the chilly front room. He unbolted the door, and Nicholas walked in. He bowed to Ephraim, paused by the threshold, his head nearly touching the low ceiling, while he searched the other faces which he did not know. Then he saw Miranda, who had held back, her heart pounding, her hands shaking, now that the moment had actually arrived. Nicholas's face lighted. His eyes burned into hers, as though he asked her a question which needed no answer except the expression on her face. He moved swiftly across the room, and before the gaping boys and thunderstruck Ephraim, took Miranda's hand and raised it to his lips. "'What's the meaning of this, sir?' shouted Ephraim. Nicholas released the girl's hand and turned to confront the astonished father. "'May I speak to you alone, Mr. Wells?' His tone plainly indicated that he was in a hurry to have done with a boring task. He made a gesture of dismissal to the others, and they obeyed it at once. Not even Abigail thought to look at Ephraim to see whether he also wished them to go. The door of the front room shut behind them. Well, whistled young Nat, sinking into a chair and staring at his sister. So that's your Mr. Van Wren. You're a deep one, Ranny. <laughs> 